Starting off with the very basic, does everybody know what this is? Which state specifically, sir? Okay, so we've got Iowa. Everybody know what this is? Farm? We know what that is. Slaves. Slaves. <laughs> so no, we... <laughs> Iowa doesn't have farm laws. No, Iowa farm boy. Uh, I'm originally, my, my family has uh, lived in Knoxville, Iowa. It took me one summer to realize and understand really quickly I did not want to be a farmer. Um, so I left, went on the road, traveling a lot. Ended up working with this organization. Specifically, my first duty station was on this, which is now sitting at the bottom of the Pacific, being a coral reef, uh, because they were not able to be sold off to be Gillette razors. I'm a veteran of these different types of operations. Now I have to point out the bottom two, OIF and OEF, were when I volunteered to be a consultant and advisor for the Marine Corps and uh, wound up sitting in a very unique sandbox environment. I also have these, which means I have way too much time on my hand. Uh, but they are business certifications. I am one of these prior. Uh, I used to fall into that, that mind game of dealing with credit card data. Does anybody deal with credit card data on a regular basis? How do we like the new PCI DSS version 3.1? Why is everybody looking at you now? <laughs> you work for PCI? Are you a QSA? Okay. You work with the QSA? So basically you, you provide a lot of documentation. Okay. Um, I also am one of these guys, which uh, not the most interesting individual in the world. Um, but this is sort of my spin on PCI-based pen testing. Um, because, you know, previously PCI used to say, you know, you could only touch systems that stored, processed, or transmit. That's changed with the new version of DS the DSS. <clears throat> so what we're going to cover today during story time, and that's basically what it is on Saturday afternoon, um, which I'm surprised with the turnout given that last night's party would like rather, there we go. <laughs> You're still partying, aren't you? Yeah, I just can't So we're going to talk about the situation. We're going to talk about some big data, um, specifically around data security. We're going to talk about the pros, uh, our need to overcome and adapt to, to the environment of dealing with large amounts of data and how we communicate that up to the business so that they can understand. We're going to talk about the necessity for baselining uh, and why that's important when it comes to metrics. And then we're going to look at getting in touch with our, our inner geek and how to leverage visualization when representing information back to business leadership. So to kick off, we're going to talk about the situation. Not this situation. So real quick in here, we have a lot of information flowing in. How many of you have the budget and resources like the, the NSA? Anybody? Nobody? No. So we're, we're constrained by manpower resources, time, money. <clears throat> However, working within those constraints, we're still expected to protect our organizations, correct? Because if something happens, we're getting that phone call that says, hey, we need to find out, you know, why, you know, why we're not doing a better job. Um, you know, on the flip side, we have tons of, of information that are available to us. However, I like to, to focus or uh, quote Dave Kennedy when he, he mentions this. We are second only to weathermen in the fact that we continue to spend more on resources, more on capital expenditures, yet we're perceived as continually getting worse. Um, you know, a lot of us, a lot of business leaderships loves to take the fact that, you know, how, do, how does business approach solving problems a lot of the time, especially in the IT or security space specifically? What do they throw at the problem? Money. You know, because if we, you know, we buy more tools, you know, however, we're falling down on the management of that side. So this slide's a little old. Um, I, I stopped it at 2013 for a specific reason because at 2013, we had lost over 371 million records. Now, to put this into context, in 2013, there were only 315 million people in the U.S. 
we have lost more records than there are people in the U.S. Does that make any sense to anybody else? So when we start looking at this, the normal, and you can't go to a security conference without the Verizon data breach report being mentioned. That's just like a requirement. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Most organizations are told about a breach coming in through external means. Very few actually recognize. Now, one of the, the folks that I work with on a very large client site is very fond in his belief of, you know, antivirus solves all the problems. The reality is AV doesn't pick up anything or, or catch a vast majority of things. Now, the bigger problem is the fact that data breach discoveries are never found by logs. But yet, all the appliances, all the network traffic going out to known command and control, going out to known bad things on the internet, th those get logged, right? But yet log review is not one of those areas that picks up on data breaches. So we, anybody in here unfamiliar with the term APT? And, and okay, so an advanced persistent threat. It's the way that most organizations respond to the fact that, you know, they've been breached. Uh, the new term now is what? What, are, what is the most common phrase now being used? What, what did IRS say was, was the result of their breach? China. What's that? China. Well, China, yeah, that was the, that, that's who was attributed. But it was sophisticated and complex. Okay. Now, the sophisticated part was I think you needed a email address to be able to send the information to that you were requesting. So the complexity of that was, was phenomenal. However, the reality is clicking on an email and responding and providing your user credentials does not constitute um, a, a sophisticated attack, uh, especially when the fact that it's a commodity attack and you're, you're popping like a vulnerability, a vulnerable service from back in, you know, 2002. Um, I was talking with a colleague last night who actually popped a vulnerability from 1999. We're failing at some of the business processes around there. Again, these attacks are persisting over a period of months. And when you start thinking about maintaining, you know, several months, or in the case of PCI, you're required to maintain three months online, nine months archival, you have a year's worth of data that data is going to contain those indicators. We have tools. Anybody in here suffer from, from having shelfware? Where your organization bought something, but they never implemented it properly, or tuned it, or you know, bought the pro services? So we have tools. We have those resources available, but we're just not managing them against the actual threats. So I'm, I, I take the, the approach of it's, you know, stop saying it's APT. Um, it's not APT if you're not patching your system. If you're failing on the OWASP top 10, which is like the low-hanging fruit, and you're not actively reviewing your logs. All of those will leave trails and indicators. So when we start getting into the, the concept of aggregating all these logs, we're talking about large types of, of data coming in. You know, the way normally we define big data is data sets that are so large and complex it becomes difficult to process using a on-hand database management tools or traditional processing methods. So, you know, we get all these different data sets coming in. You know, we get structured, unstructured, email, you name it, it's coming in. So then we buy, what do we do? We buy more tools. You know, insert the vendor's no, uh, choice that you're, you're pulling in. And, you know, we, we can run some, some reports and it looks pretty on the dashboard. And it's a great thing to show an auditor that we're, we're doing it, but we're still not managing it. So we know we have big data in our environments coming in from security appliances from there. The one thing that we suffer from is that information overload. How many of you have security appliances that turn around and email alerts to your inbox? Just out of curiosity. Couple? Yeah, a lot more than, than a couple. What happens after a while? We start looking at those reports and we're like, okay, I'm, I'm working on this, I'll get to this later. 
And then we become desensitized to the fact that those alerts are coming in. Then something bad happens. Um, so it ends up, you know, we get this, this iceberg where we only see part of the portion. And now we need to find out what's actually going on. When we're talking about big data security, we're talking about information. How many organizations in here have admitted to the fact that they are data hoarders? One. We hoard data. We never purge anything. We never get it out of our systems. It's like in pages in a book, though, when we're, we're looking at things, and all this data is dispersed and in, in out in, in, in different areas. <laughs> So ultimately, it ends up looking like looking for a needle in a haystack. You know, the reality is when we find that information, or when we're looking for that specific information around an, an indicator, sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack, in a heath, hayfield, being chased by this guy, in the middle of a hurricane, while being shot at by the Death Star. Because we're, again, the problem is we're not managing the process. We're not putting in the proper tools to, or the proper processes in place to actually make use of that data. Now, who are my malware people in here? Anybody in here deal with incident response, forensics? Do you ever find code that actually comes out and, you know, tells you this is a worm, this is a virus, this is a trojan? It's not difficult to find, but it's never that easy. And it is definitely never this easy to find the needle in the haystack. How do most of us end up coming across when we have a, a indicator of compromise or a, a, a issue within our organization? How do we normally find that? Broke something else? How do we normally find a needle laying around the house? Stepping on it. However, occasionally we do have those very serendipitous discoveries. Um, does anybody know the definition of serendipity? What's that? That's right. So looking in the haystack and, you know, that's what you find. So being an Iowa farm boy, this never happened. Uh, that, that was hours and hours of Googling right there. So... <clears throat> This is actually from an active case that, that my partner and I had actually worked um, where we actually came across and recovered information during a incident response case. Now, as we're seeing, we're, we're seeing an, an interchange go back and forth. Now, does anybody see anything? And, the, and I should preface that this was a system that was live on the Internet. It was providing network services out for, for customers via one of their web services. Reading over this real quick, what are some of the things that you can automatically pick up on? Who remembers using the term sysop or system operator? Does anybody know what a system operator is? <laughs> anybody ever remember that dial tone that you dial into on a BBS? And you had a system operator. It's a, a period uh, term that's used from, from several years back. Now, I should say that we did this in, was it late 2000? Or it was actually in December of 2012. So we have a couple of things that we, we identified. Also, remember, this is a server, and they use the term PC. That's a little odd if you're the system, if you're the system operator or the system administrator for a server, right? What we'd actually had uncovered was that the system had been compromised, one, for a, for a long period of time. And two, it wasn't a single actor that was on the server. There were two competing entities arguing over who owned that system. The client was oblivious to this. In fact, this was not even the original reason why we were brought in. We found this, what was it, in the recycle bin? System volume information. System volume information. Thank you, Jake. But oh wait, it gets better. <laughs> it gets way better for that. 
and a farm boy can wish because we actually got a little bit more detailed than that. And for those of you who don't know, um, I work for a company, Rendition InfoSec. Uh, my partner is a gentleman by the name of Jake Williams, and if you follow him on Twitter, you know him as Malware Jake. So we ended up finding this in the system, yeah, system volume. Scanned and hacked by, welcome. This is on a production system. Their system administrators never looked for it. They never saw it. Did it really happen? Yes, yes it did. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Jake later, but we actually did find this. Um, and the files did date back several years. So ultimately, how did, how did we end up finding this? Well, we stopped looking for the needle in the haystack and we, we burned the haystack that is the best way and approach to take it. We started taking out known good, taking it out of the equation, and started looking for really different things that were out of the, no out of the norm. Um, for those of you tomorrow who, who's planning on going to the party tonight? All right, so Jake is doing a talk tomorrow at 8 a.m. We will be giving away a Raspberry Pi 2 for the for one lucky winner um, who manages to make it here at 8 a.m. Um, he's going to be talking on, what is it, service host? Is that service host in your pocket or are you happy to see me? Yeah, anomaly detection. Thank you. Okay. Politically correct, politically correct version. <clears throat> so one of the things that we we struggle with is having that limited visibility because, you know, organizations are great at buying, you know, investing a lot in QRadar or Logarithm or whatever your sim of choice is, and they do a couple of different things. Their, their approaches tend to differ. Either one, they throw all their logs at the appliance, which is that a good idea? No. Or they try to do it themselves because, you know, they, they are, are very you know, they, they have a very small subset because it's only a compliance effort. So they have a small subset of data going in, which that sort of defeats the purpose of being able to correlate all that information. So we need to have the enterprise visibility. Uh, we need to have context, and if we're not doing that, we don't have the proper context for our organization. Um, you know, you never know which system is going to be the system that's going to be breached. Now, from a, a network defender side, I can tell you that I can tell you specifically which system is going to be the one that's going to get breached and is going to lead to the compromise of your organization. Does anybody want to take a guess? It's the one system you don't know about. That, that's going to be the one that's going to be the breach. Part of the reason why we capture logs and we, we capture... Uh, this type of information is so that way we can recreate and understand how the attack was actually executed. Because once you start leaving that uh, digital evidence behind, it starts painting a picture. We also don't know if the attack is actually over at that point. At what stage in the attack are they actually at? In, in short, we basically just don't know what's going on. And this is part of the, the reason, is because of the fact that we don't have that visibility into the enterprise. So how can we bring some illumination to the enterprise? N not that enterprise. There's got to be more science fiction geeks than me in this room. Really? Serious? Or is everybody still recovering from last night? So increased visibility allows us to, to see the enterprise. We were able to put it in con into context. We can see what has been compromised. Have they pivoted? Have they moved? We can find out if the attack is over. We can start providing our leadership the answers that they need to know. Because uh, who went through the Heartbleed and Venom and Poodle and whatnot? Were you getting those phone calls saying, you know, how does this impact our organization at like really odd hours during the day? What's that? Screams and crying? No, no, we're a Microsoft shop. Heartbleed doesn't really impact us. Yeah. We're not using SSL. We need to talk. Let, let's, let's carve out 30 minutes and have a little discussion. Because after all, once we start getting all that information, you know, knowing is half the battle. The other half of the battle is, or quarter of the battle is red lasers, and then you have your blue lasers.
<laughs> so let's talk about the cost of failure. So you have your investigation, forensics cost, customer and partner impacts, because once you have a data breach, you're going to have to deal with customers downstream. You're going to have to talk with some of your partners. They're going to want to know. Your public image might be a little tarnished. Um, you know, when you're dealing with business, and, th and this is the thing from the technology side that sometimes we struggle to understand, the business still has to function and operate. <coughs> Something like this can, can limit their ability to generate revenue. Now, that's a bad thing, because if they're not being able to generate revenue, um, who, who pays the security practitioners and IT practitioners salaries? Oh, the business, right? The, the folks that we're supporting. Things like regulatory fines, civil claims, class action, lawyers. Who in here likes lawyers? You like lawyers? Let's carve out 45 minutes <laughs> and have a talk about that. So ultimately what we want to be able to do is go back and answer one simple question. Can we as an organization and is our board okay with absorbing the costs with, associated with investigating, remediating, and associated addressing regulatory fines and any civil claims? Now, if you ask that question to business leadership, what do you think that their answer is going to be? And let me, let me preface it with there's only one right answer. Because a lot of the times, organizations love to talk about the fact that, you know, we take security seriously. Because publicly, that's the only right thing that they can say. You never, or you, you never hear somebody talk about, you know, oh yeah, we are compliant. No, they, they talk about, you know, how secure they are. Or, or, or how, and we're, we sit there in the wings and we're like, um, what company do you work for? We're, we're not secure. We don't have that visibility. We can't give you the answers you need to make those claims. <clears throat> so as information security professionals, we need to be able to adapt and overcome. And somebody asked me yesterday the necessity to learn the business, and if that was if it was a, a necessity for information security practitioners to learn their business. Absolutely. If you don't know what your business does and how they they facilitate business, you're going to fight uphill trying to get things like budget, resources, additional full-time employees, contractors, consultants things that you need to do. So I, I beseech you, please go out and learn what your business does. You know, a lot of the times I'll work with organizations and I'll ask them, you know, I'll talk with their IT department or I'll talk with their security professionals and I'll be like, tell me what you do. And IT is notorious for sitting there and telling me, you know, oh, we manage the SAN. We deal with the exchange server. We deal with, you know, this, that, or the other. No, you sell clothes or you provide patient care, or you provide a insurance product to a customer. That's what you do. Everything that we do in information technology and in information security is to provide the business the ability to deliver on what they do. Traditional security measures, you know, we, we had this concept of, you know, we just need a firewall, we just need antivirus, we just need, you know, defense in depth. That sucks. Um, and it becomes a bit of a struggle because, you know, sometimes leadership refuses to believe just how bad it actually is. Now, when I say it's bad, you know, there, there's executive leadership. Oh, you know. Polar bear on the beach is dead. That's how bad it actually is. We need to act now or something bad will happen. And there's a big difference between, you know, being compromised through, you know, a, a, an actual true advanced persistent threat or a, a, you know, somebody burned a zero day to get into your organization versus the fact that we're just not patching the systems because the business doesn't understand the importance and value. You know, I, I've been involved in a, a number of, of pen tests where, you know, when we're scoping out the engagement, which, by the way, if you scope pen tests, you fail automatically. But... We've had clients that have actually come back and said, no, no, those systems are too critical to pen test. Um, that's what you're trying to protect, right? Then you need to test it. Um, because if I run a Nessus scan 
during a technical evaluation of a, of a system and it topples it over, you might want to be, you know, taking a little bit more look into it. So we're talking about, you know, the, the hamster wheel of pain. You know, and this is great when, when, you know, pick your vendor of joys come in, you know, we're, we start off here and, you know, hey, everything's good, great, it's Monday morning. You know, heart bleed comes out and the first question, you know, am I hosed? Um, then you get a vendor that comes in and says, yes, and, you know, we have the tool that proves it. And then everybody goes into sheer panic mode, they fix the problem, and then they go right back into business as usual, and it's very reactive. These are different types of attack vectors that, you know, outside of the scope of whatever regulatory body you drive, that an attacker will use. And it's funny because when we're engaged to do uh, some of the, the attack and pens that we work on, a lot of the times when we talk, start talking about, you know, phishing campaigns or um, phishing and, and whaling campaigns, they stop right there and say, no, no, no social engineering, no phishing. Why not? Oh, we'll fail at that. Okay, chances are you've already failed at it and you're having a free pen test done right now, you just don't realize it yet. Um, so, you know, how, how prepared are you? Now, a lot of the times when we start talking about threats to the organization, you know, the, the actual threats that are out there are not what Hollywood portrays. Um, you know, they're, they're actual threats. You know, you have your criminal syndicates, you have your nation state actors, you have hacktivist groups, you have terrorist groups that are all out there looking, and they have different motivations, and they have different ways that they are going to affect an attack. Hollywood has us believing that, you know, Chris Helmsley, Thor, who, who's attacking, you know, tracking down the, the... Anybody in here actually sit through Black Hat? One guy, like, started to raise his hand and like, rolled it down. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit to seeing Black Hat. So in 25 years, I have never had a nuclear reactor explode on me. Um, I've never had to chase somebody down wearing a bulletproof vest and a gun. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure my wife probably wishes I look like Chris Hemsley, but that's not really the case. Um, but the reality is, is, is we've, society has distorted the view of what the actual attacker is. You know, we think that, you know, the, the attacker is some nine-year-old sitting in his underoos in his parents' basement breaking into the system. These are motivated organizations that have a, a predefined agenda for why they want to get in. We have zero influence when it comes to the motivation of an adversary. Zero. For those of you who sat through the threat intelligence course yesterday, the only thing, and I have to attribute this to, to my partner Jake, the only thing that we get to choose when it comes to being attacked is the field of battle. If we're not doing things right internally, we are going to suffer. So let's talk about baseline and Crayolas. So during this, this actual breach incident that we were, or this, this compromise situation that we were running through, um, we, we decided that we needed to help them understand the baseline of their environment because nobody really understands the baseline of what their network environment is. Nobody can really define what good is in their environment. Has anybody ever taken the time to baseline their environment? One. So you baseline the bad as part of the good, right? Yeah, absolutely. We were so. talking about what we were doing and what we were doing. In fact, I work for a university, so it's a word mindset tool, and we knew that when we started. The question is whether the cultural word mindset is set tool or not. And that, that's, part of, and that, that's part of the reason. And a lot of us inherit, has anybody been with their organization since the inception and, and development and growth of their network from the very beginning? One. Most of us inherit the network from somebody else, and we don't know what good is. But we have to start somewhere. So we start with baselines. Not that baseline. That's not what I meant. I don't know how that got in there. <coughs> the importance of baselines is they provide that point of reference. For those of you who've worked in management, you know that you have to be able to measure how far you go and how productive you are as far as being able to make progress, to demonstrate and advance. 
Um, knowing where you, you are presently can show that. You know, are you running in a straight line? Are you running zigzags? Are you running in circles? Which one you're at? So when we talk about network based lining, knowing who you're communicating with, that's important. Knowing what's going on on your network perimeter, very important. Knowing what's going on within your network is important. Who has access to what? I don't know how many times we've seen, you know, the open shares or, you know, the ability to remotely access something that you should never have the, the ability to do. And, and I don't mean like the, you know, the, 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 the C share being enabled. I'm talking like jumping from a development environment into production. Um, because our, our development environments mirror our production exactly, right? We have to be able to know what good is. Are they really important to be able to know that? Oh, yes. Because ultimately, you're going to be playing a, a game of, of roulette if you can't answer those questions. Um, so we actually, again, another case that we were working on, and I will tell you this does not end well for them. <clears throat> So, anybody, you know, again, science fiction fans, anybody know what evil lurks in the hearts of men? That's right, the shadow knows. Unfortunately, Ed does not have the shadow. What Ed does have, though, is malware Jake. He walks into a room and, like, computers just bow before him and they just, like, Here, here's my memory. Um, so we started working on this case. And after some initial analysis, we started seeing some really, not really normal types of things. Started identifying uh, known malware, multiple remote administration tools, which this is one of the reasons why when we talk about network standardization, um, pick a solution, stick with it. If you, if you find GoToPC, log me in, Citrix, RDP, VNC, all loaded on the same machine, might that be an indicator that something's a little hinky? Is that normal for your organization? Um, the ne next question is, is, why is that normal for your organization? Especially when they're on the same system. So we ended up talking with the business leadership and said, you know, hey, what our recommendation is, and I love the shirt that Chris is, is, is wearing one. P caps or it never happened. Packet captures don't lie. Logs can be tampered with, but if you're capturing packets, you're going to see reality. So we actually talked with the business and said, hey, listen, we need to do some further analysis. We suspect that your systems have been compromised. Um, we don't know the validity of the, the information that we're able to collect because we don't know how far the infestation and the, and the compromise actually goes. What we want to do is be able to uh, pull the information out at the, at the network layer. Um, and this is predominantly because of the fact that Tom, their part-time network guy, had shared with us at one point, he was so happy because he had actually installed this organization's Linksys firewall. Now, for those of you who are familiar working in an enterprise environment, and, and, and to level set and give the industry, this is a payment industry, by the way. <laughs> they handle your credit cards. Um, and at this case, they shared credit cards. Um, do you put Linksys firewalls in, in your production networks? That's, a, that's usually a consumer product that you, that you put in. So we ended up actually pulling out some information. And for those of you who, who can't see that, does everybody know what that is just by glancing? It's a TCP dump, right? The, the technology people were like, yeah, we know what this is. And, and Jake's uber scary because he can look at that and go, you know, there, there's bad here. <laughs> you know, this IP address goes back to these people. This is a bad day. However, while we saw the IOCs when we saw the, the badness going on, if I show a packet capture to an executive or a business leader, what are they going to do? They're going to have a human buffer overflow, right? They're going to look at us and go, ching, ching. what? 
or it's going to be either it's going to be like the the parents version of the peanuts. Wah, 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 wah. So we sat there and we we're trying to figure out a way to do this. So so Jake is like, so this is way bad. Shortly followed with, I'm getting a beer. That's usually the indicator that it is bad. I said, make that too. We need a plan B because we can't just go up and show <coughs> a, a, you know, a bunch of PCAPs and, and packet captures. So we came up with a plan B. Plan B started off like this. Followed by that. Well, <laughs> that's what I started off with, but, but it progressed. And then we did the, the, you know, we started off with McCallum's. Ended up with the tequila because, and then Ed found up like this <laughs> because it was bad. Oh. So what is the easiest way for people to understand the data set? And also, did you see Elvis too? <laughs> so being able to sit there and see the technical aspect uh, one of the things that we decided to do was, you know, the best way to represent how bad this was, and, and keeping in mind, this is a, a payment card provider or a uh, independent sales organization within the payment card industry. They process credit cards. They were regional to their area. They actually only service customers in five states. We decided to turn around and draw some pictures for them and say, okay, this is actually who you're talking to. And we were able to sit there and they were like, wait a minute, we, what? We're talking to, to Eastern Europe? We, we don't have offices there. Okay, you might want to look into that. Um, I think it's the only time in my career that I've ever heard the, the, phrase, the, the phrase, you know, what do you want to do? What, what should we do? Followed by the burn it to the ground. <laughs> Collect the insurance, walk away. So what are the metrics? Being able to convey and measure information and being able to provide that back up in a way that management can understand and quickly consume. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the metrics are for your organization. You'll have to figure those out for yourself. So, when it comes to dealing with big data and any type of data and information, what we end up wanting to do is speak specifically to the facts. Don't guess. Um, it, it's, it leaves yourself open to, to too many issues. While you can try and argue with numbers, if I can demonstrate that you have data going to this location at this size, this frequency, you, you really can't argue with it. You may not like it, you may not like the information, but you have to address the information. You know, the ability to measure the posture when it comes from, from the value side of having metrics within your security department or within your IT department, you can measure your posture and you can show and demonstrate this is where we're at currently. This is our growth pattern and then you can actually start measuring against it. You can also then leverage that to justify budget. You know, we are working 10,000 tickets a month. We need to look at uh, addressing these things because this is where the majority of your resources are being applied to. That's one of the areas that in information security that we struggle with is understanding the necessity for being able to communicate back to the business in a way that they can understand. That is one of the key things and reasons why I say, you know, start capturing this information. It may seem like a, an additional workload initially, but if you're able to go back and justify headcount or justify budget, is it going to be worth the effort? If you can justify getting an additional two or three FTEs on your team, would that help you be able to do your job and protect your organization? Might it be a value to you? Absolutely. You'll also be able to raise um, understanding and awareness of what it is the security department does. Because normally, the only time the security department or the security organization gets any type of, of acknowledgement is when? when things go wrong, when the organization has had a bad day, when they've wound up on the, what I call the Brian Krebs IDS list, that's a bad day. And ultimately, the, again, this all goes back to one reason, because that's what really matters to the business, is money. 
And if you can demonstrate the risks and be able to measure those risks, and being able to measure the workload and the, the ROI that comes out of it, they can invest in your organization or in the, within your department, and that then turns around and builds their brand and their ability to do and generate revenue. So when we start talking about metrics specifically, you have to know your audience. Who are you speaking to? You have to know what's important to them. Has anybody ever seen one of those reports issued at some point in their career about, you know, hey, our, our spam filters have blocked 50,000 spam messages this month. Has anybody ever dealt with that? That is a worthless metric except for at one point in the year. When you can aggregate all that information up and use it to define your budget. You know, because of the fact that, yes, it did block spam, what you need to translate that back into is this is how much time we did not have to work on these types of, of tickets when it came to, comes to spam. You're able to then develop and define the indicators. Always check your information. When it comes to dealing with some example metrics specifically to security, Baseline your, your network defense, patch compliance, you know, anybody in here and go have their patch cycle go in excess of 120 days? You're all shaking your head, but I can almost guarantee that somebody in here does because if you patch a system and break the production network, you're going to roll that patch back. You're, wanting to, you're going to want to test it through QA, dev, before it ever hits production to make sure that it doesn't break the revenue. So we have lag. Being able to report that back up and say, oh yes, by the way, we're still, we're still out 60% on our systems because they're still in development. Making management aware of just how far behind things are. The number of policy exceptions. You know, how many times do we see a policy that's in pay, on paper, but we might not really necessarily adhere to it? Because it's required for some regulatory requirement but it doesn't fit the business. Are we matching those? Who are the top talkers on the network, from the networking side? Why is that important? Because is your top talker, one of your top 10 talkers, talking to a known C2? Might be an interesting thing. So again, getting into some more of the, the sample metrics, you know, we stopped 70,000 viruses from getting in this week. Ooh, yay. Okay, I know. 25,000 spam messages, 5,000, you know, port scans. Ooh, yay. Again, good metrics. Being able to give and represent information in ways that the business can consume. So data visualization, taking the raw data and turning it into some useful information. So the information security data visualization process, real quick. What is the problem you're trying to define? Collect the appropriate information, transform it, and visualize it. Again, we have a plethora of information that is available that we can tap into. At any point, I would beg to say that we would have no lack of information. We can pull information from external resources. Firewalls, routers, you, you name it, we can get information from our... Do, does anybody suffer from a lack of information? No? Okay. So one of the things that, that I've been involved in is a project called Davix. Um, that allowed to collect some information, and I'm going to, to go through this quickly. Extracting information, transforming information, and you'll be able to see this on the, on the slide because I've been given, or on the video because I've been given the five minute warning. Be able to, to transform information and get it back. These are some of the, the software packages that are involved in the Davix project. Some of the cases that you can use that we'll look at real quick. Anybody ever run a Nessus report? Nessus reports are really good at producing a large amount of data. 3,367 pages worth of, of documentation from one client site. Who's going to read that? Anybody? Now, if you take that same information and visualize this in a heat map, 
What are you automatically drawn to? Top red side over here, right? This allows you to quickly get through the information and actually focus on where some of the concerns are based upon how you've defined getting the data. You can process that information really quick. Would you rather look at 3,000 plus pages or that? Some additional information, you know, being able to take your logs, what you can do with them, you know, finding out who's accessing. I had a colleague down in, in Atlanta who said, hey, somebody's hitting my, you know, ac uh, Outlook web access. Who is it? Um, it was actually a farm in Kansas that when you zoomed in on Google Maps was literally in the middle of a farm field. So I had to call him back and say, cows. Being able to take your access logs. Um, got a call from a, a business owner saying, hey, we're losing a lot of intellectual property. Pulled their logs, started seeing what information was actually going out. We're, we're losing a lot of information around sales, you know. Processed the information a little bit more and we found out that Bill S., he was a hard worker because he was logging in all the time. Except for one small problem. They didn't have a Bill S. within their organization. They'd been compromised by one of their competitors. Being able to track botnet activity within an organization, how it's pivoted, how it's moved around, being able to pull that information and quickly transform that because while we do understand things like network traffic flows and uh, packet captures, being able to get that visual representation gives us that ability to quickly look at it and go, oh my, this is bad. And ultimately, this all comes back to the lack of log review. This should never have happened. None of these could have, would have happened to the extent that they did had the organizations been monitoring and managing their logging systems, being able to aggregate that information. So with that, I want to thank everybody. Again, everybody that, that has made Circle City that much more enjoyable. I've had the opportunity to speak with Circle City now for two years. So welcome to Circle City's second year, and thank you for attending.